So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this morning. Um, one of the big challenges that's coming through is how we re-engage people back into cities and how we actually look at how we get trade going again. I think it's going to be quite fundamental. The, I think the, at the moment, there's more and more employers coming out saying they're concerned in, from their first reactions of how people want to come back to work, or shall we say they don't want to come back to work. I think people, a lot of people are saying they're enjoying fellow, would like to stay on fellow. Uh, but actually also they want to work remotely. So the forecast of coming back into London at the moment is something in the, in the region of about 15% until September and then rising to about 40% during September and then rising to about 50 to 60% by the year end, which is actually going to make London, it's going to be quite a challenge. So how do we cope with that? Question mark. Oh, and are we, that's what the real question here, beginning to create a psychology of fear or is it something a bit deeper where people want a different lifestyle and different work pattern that's what i really want to explore today now lots of people have said this is obviously all new territory and it is the last time we faced such a thing was in 1665 and no i can't remember it just for the only one who wants to make that crack um when 25 percent apparently of london's population was uh, sadly died and that was finished by the great fire of london in 1666, which I'm hoping we don't get the same this time around. Um, but regardless, we, if we're operating on 30%, 40% less audience, how's that going to impact on operations? What does it mean and what are we going to do about things on that? Um, we're also seeing the government obviously making, providing incentives this week uh, to try and kickstart the particular hospitality sector, which is interesting. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing redundancies grow. Obviously, yesterday we heard the news from John Lewis, we heard the news from Boots, and how is this going to carry on impacting? So I'm particularly interested to see on what your view is. Most people, I think, forecast it's going to be a 12-month road to recovery at best. Hotels are still reckon they won't get back to 2019 levels until 2022. That's come from a webinar we hosted this week, um, which had about 400 people attend. That seems to be the view. Is that right? Is that not right? And have we created a psychology of fear? Or is it, is it that, that deeper thing I keep referring to, which is quite interesting as well? And will cities have to change? So there's a lot there in, um, in the mix for us to discuss. David, can I kick off with you? Um, yep, sure. I know uh, you have some quite view, strong views on this. I, I, I think there's... Um, the, the, the first thing I would want to say is I think there's a bit of a disconnect uh, between uh, one side of the government and the other side of the government, because at, at the end of the day, we all sit and listen to what, um, to what the government tell us about what we should be doing with regards to our own uh, safety. And, and it's a bit like, um, a bit like uh, sitting in a room with a, um, with a manic depressive, you know, you, you, you don't know quite which part of the government you're actually listening to at any one time. One, one is saying, go out, go out, go out. And the other is saying, stay in, stay in, stay in. And I think the, I, I think the, the psychology of the situation is, re is really the important part of this. And the government has, has put a lot of effort into messaging, but they, they're, they're messaging... <coughs> regularly seems to be conflicting, changing, very detailed, um, uh, to the point where actually lots of people don't trust the government's advice. Uh, there's things like the mask, you should wear them, you shouldn't wear them, all that stuff going on. And that, what that's re resulting in, it seems to me, is that there's a big chunk of the population who've become kind of agoraphobic. Um, and there's a, also a huge chunk of the population who are right at the other end of the of the spectrum who are just disregarding government advice because they don't think it's relevant. And I'm, I'm minded of the Japanese soldiers. I don't know if you remember in 2005, they were, there were two Japanese soldiers found in the Philippines, in a remote Philippines island. They'd been there for 60 years from 1945 to 2005 because they feared that the, the war was still going on and they would be court-martialed and shot. And, and there is a proportion of our population that are like these Japanese soldiers, it seems to me. And 
for, for me, I think hospitality actually has a really critical part to play in actually giving people the confidence <coughs> to go out. And uh, I think particularly London tourism for people from the UK is a really, really important opportunity because you know, foreign tourists are just not coming to London and, and that's mostly because of the travel issues. So I, I think we have a very, you know, I can't wait for the first week of August um, because then we have an opportunity as a sector to really try and change people's mindsets. Because, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I have a view, which is that there is, there's no evidence around second wave. Everyone's talking about, oh, I was going to be a second wave. I don't think there's any evidence of that at all. And it's all based upon uh, a flu virus that where there was almost no science a hundred years ago. Um, and I, I, you know, there's, there's no evidence at all that's you know, look at Mars, look at, but look at uh, uh, SARS, look at MERS, uh, look at other coronaviruses. And, you know, Isn't it all based off Spanish flu? Not going to happen. Isn't it all based off Spanish flu? Which had it is, the, the 1918 outbreak. And, and you know, the, the reality is they, you know, they don't even know whether the flu virus that caused the first wave was the same virus that caused the second wave. Uh, it was 100 years ago, science was much less advanced than it is now. So I, I, I think it is, you know, we have, to, we, have to, we have to stand up to the plate in hospitality and help people adjust to the fact that we could, just can't stay indoors um, for, uh, for the next two years until eventually it all goes away. It's not going to be possible. So we've, we've, got to, we've got to get people out there. Mm -hmm. Agree with that. So quickly put you on the spot, David, your forecast recovery, how long is it going to take us? <laughs> Um, I, do you know, I don't know. I, 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 my, my view changes every day, um, depending upon what I read, what I see. Um, but uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It is about cities and, uh, and it's about getting people back in cities. You know, th there was someone, a friend of mine last week who said that at 6.30 in the evening, he ran from Trafalgar Square to High Hoban uh, in the middle of the road. So that's the level of change that needs. As long as he wasn't naked, I said. I don't know. It, we, we're probably a year away from normal levels. I don't know. How the hell? How the hell do I assess that? I don't know. Gary, you're in uh, central London at the moment. What's yeah. It like? What's it like? On um, I mean, I, surprisingly, I've just travelled in on the train today, and for the first time, Fleet Street's actually got quite a bit of activity going on. It appears that some of the shops are preparing to open next week. Um, the shutters have started to come down and, and for the first time today I can honestly say that the trains were a little bit busier coming in and on a Friday it's normally the quieter day um, I've, I, I'm the same as David I have good days and bad days and I, I've spoken to a lot of my clients that opened on the restaurant sector at the weekend and a couple of them uh, West End wise did well um, got one operator, uh, Heart of Covent Garden, that did 55, uh, 55k net on Saturday. Uh, the demand was there. People coming in from out of town. Um, you know, weekend uh, weekenders coming in. Um, the business market is the thing to kick off. If you look around the city, and Chris, you've been up to the city, it has been absolutely dead. Um, but I, 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 again, I have good and I have good and bad days. You know, today I've come in, I'm, I'm positive, and I actually do think August is going to be the key month. And I think if companies have got to start moving, you know, people back into town, getting people out, and you know, we, we the, the government's also got to really push their stance. We need to start moving again. The economy needs to start moving again. Um, and there is a fear factor. I've seen it, my, you know, my, my own partner's, you know, spending X amount of time keeping away and, you know, doesn't want to go near people. We, it was brought on by the government, this, you know, absolute, we must stay clear of people. And it's changing that mindset and it's how, how quickly it can be done now. So well, that's, the inter but that's the interesting point you've touched on, Gary, isn't it? Is it fear? Mm -hmm. Is it fear? Yes. Because if you, if you have a, a Covent Garden restaurant doing 55K in one, one weekend, which is fantastic news, mm -hmm. people, are, people are going out to eat, aren't they? Yeah, people. they looked at the demographics of their diet, and it was a it was a predominantly younger crowd. Um, I mean, they're a high spend restaurant, uh, destination restaurant, but it it, it um, 
it, it, I think it's more the older generation that are that are scared to come in the the anyone sort of the, the 40 plus mark and again if you look at the city you look at the business market that covers you know a, a lot of that market around here so yeah I, I, I think the the restaurant market I, I'm a little bit more optimistic for that now I think hotels are going to be tough for a, a good while from the from the, uh, the zoom earlier in the week I think you know certainly the city London is going to take a while to come to come back on that um, but again, I have good, like David, I have good days and bad days. Today, I'm in a very positive day. Uh, and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I, 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 I think August is going to be the key month. And I think by September, we, we will get a really good barometer about, you know, the, the business market uh, and, the, you know, who's, who's really, you know, coming back into town. Okay, bring a younger one. Racer, can I bring you in at this point? And double Dutch, how, how are things for you? Um, I are think, you going out? Uh, I went out on Saturday. <laughs> uh, I, I live in Soho. I think it was absolutely carnage here uh, on Saturday. Incredible. Like, just people, they uh, closed the road. So it was just literally like nothing else. Carnival. I think that was crazy and way too much. I really don't get why uh, the government opened on a Saturday night instead of just on a Monday and kind of start slowly for people to get used to people who really wanted to get out at least there was kind of some weekdays to kind of prepare but um i think for us um i think the entree is slowly very slowly kind of um going opening i think uh nobody's really i think everyone's kind of for, from our point of view in terms of kind of Getting in touch with our customers again, I think it's quite difficult because everyone's on a skeleton staff and very focused on just um, trying to be normal and, and reopening. So I think quite still very slow. Um, we are trying to support, to kind of get in touch to, to support with, even if it's just free stock or whatever. Uh, but even that is quite difficult to get in touch with people. Um, so I think it just takes, it needs a few more weeks and then. Um, so as you're, living, as, as you're living in Soho, do you notice a fear factor or is it? No, not at all. Not at all. I think it's crazy. I wish that people were a little bit more fearful here. <laughs> <laughs> no, crazy. Yeah. That's funny. Um, bringing the Scottish perspective, Gary? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I apologize in advance. We have some roadworks going on outside, so it might get a bit noisy. Um, what, what, what we see in Glasgow is there is definitely more people out on the streets. A um, lot more people going into shops, still not really social distancing. Um, my, my view is uh, I think people will wait a little longer to see what transpires from people starting to mingle. And that in itself will give confidence or not confidence in, in if the virus is, is still prevalent out there, uh, given the fact that social distancing isn't really being observed um, as prevalently. <laughs> the, the other thing, I've recently got involved in uh, the Glasgow Hoteliers Association, who sit on a, a version of STURG, the, the Strategic Scottish Tourism Forum, Glasgow itself has got a forum. Uh, and they've highlighted just what we've been saying over the last few weeks, the necessity of the city doing some sort of promotion to get people to feel confident and comfortable to come back into the city centre. As, as, as we know, not just the co consumers, but also the workforce. So there's about, uh, there's about to happen, some work happen to start promoting the safety of people coming back into the city. I haven't got the detail of that yet, Chris, but I'll, certainly I'll share it with you when I get it. Um, but it's positive to see that Glasgow itself is starting to take the, the, the mantle and start promoting itself again. Yeah, oh, that is good. Alex, Scottish perspective, from your point of view? I went to Edinburgh earlier this week and uh, good morning everyone. Sorry, I'm straight into it because I, uh, I was on the, uh, on the road to Edinburgh in the car and I heard something I hadn't heard for four or five months that there is a significant traffic jam on the Edinburgh City Bypass, which is our version of the M25. It's like a clogged artery more than a bypass. Um, and whereas in, in the past for years that's always filled us with dread, anyone trying to get anywhere. Um, 
if, if, if the bypass is full, you're not going to get anywhere that day. Um, it actually, um, it made me feel pretty good. It made me feel heartened because it, it made me think, you know what, people are on the bypass to get to Edinburgh. They're not bypassing Edinburgh. They're actually on their way into Edinburgh. That's why the queues start because people are trying to get off on the slip roads. And I eventually got into Edinburgh and I, it was it was the happiest traffic jam I've ever been in. But I, I, I got into Edinburgh and it was like people had, it's like nothing had happened. There were people queuing outside shops. There were a few people wearing masks, but nothing much. It seemed to, it seemed to be like people were desperate to get back into the city, which uh, from what I've spoken to Chris about in terms of London is very much the opposite. It might be to do with volumes. Um, Edinburgh is not full by any means, but there's definitely a desire to get back in there. And people are, if I can get out and I can get into the city, I'm going back in there now. So it's encouraging. So if, if, if people are struggling there now, let's just quickly on this one. Do you, people obviously have to travel into London, into Edinburgh and into mm. Glasgow, obviously, hopefully as well. Then is, is it something slightly different mm. that people have changed, changing lifestyles or looking to change lifestyles? Is that a bigger, is that actually part of this? I think it could be. And actually, I missed out something there as well. I don't know what the trains are like. There are obviously a lot of train lines coming to Edinburgh. And I would suspect they are probably as they have been for the last three or four months. People are probably quite wary of, uh, public transport and that's maybe why they're now driving in so actually it's going to be a different dynamic there's going to be uh, issues getting into Edinburgh even more so than normal um, are people changing their attitudes to working from home we might be on a um, it, it might be like a, a not a sweet spot but it might be a, a bit of a novelty at the moment people haven't been into the city for three or four months and they're desperate to get back in um, we were talking about this earlier. I think there will be more of an inclination for people to work from home. The days of nipping down to London or across to Glasgow or up to Aberdeen for one meeting are gone, certainly for now, because people have this platform. Um, and I think they're, they're going to be a bit more used to, to working from, from home if they have to. There'll be those who are desperate to get back in because they like the interaction, they like the banter. But then when they get to their offices, there might not be the same atmosphere there was because other people will be happier staying at home. Hamish, your thoughts on this? Um, look, I sort of, like some of the uh, group of positive and negative days um, from a, a travel and airline perspective, um, I think it's a long road back. Um, we're starting to see some glimpses of sort of the the larger carriers um, trying to get planes back in the air. Um, you know, the, the change in the quarantine for a large number of countries has certainly helped. And we've seen a, a sort of a, a flurry of um, small activity um, over the last week with airlines appearing to sort of want product um, moving forward into, you know, August and September and October. Um, I think there's still a, a huge amount of concern around the fact that the US and uh, Dubai, Middle East, um, are not on that list. Um, and until those airlines, those regions, you know, get off the, the quarantine list, we're not going to see any major volumes. Um, you know, they are, without a doubt, the two largest routes uh, in and out of the UK, sort of the... the uh, East coast of the, the US and also Dubai, um, the, the sheer volume of passengers on both those routes is, is staggering. And if, if there's a quarantine, that's not going to happen. Um, I was in France earlier on in the week um, and you know, in sort of a few sort of small rural sort of touristy towns. Um, and certainly my observations there was it was very quiet. You know, there was certainly about 20% of restaurants, cafes open, 20% of shops may be open, small numbers of people um, sitting on um, terraces and eating, um, but, but it, was, it was pretty quiet. Um, and if you want to look at the, the M25 as a, a gauge, we came back on Wednesday night on the M25 from Folkestone and traveled at 70 miles an hour for an hour and a quarter no traffic and that was at between five and six o'clock at night. And a trip that would normally take me minimum 50 minutes took us 40 minutes. Um, so I sort of do have reservations when I see things like that. Um, there is definitely fear. Um, and, um, you know, I think the government, the government's got to change the message and provide some very clear facts about 
who really is at risk and that they're still, you know, the, the message that early on was very prevalent, that this is a very mild disease for a large percentage of the population seems to have been lost and we only seem to be talking about deaths and or people in hospital, which is a very small number of people who actually have the disease. Yeah. Stefan, can I bring you in at this point? Yes. Good morning, everyone. Um, morning. It's very interesting. Um, uh, referring to the positive and negative, uh, for us, I would say, in the region, it's positive. Uh, people are keen to go back to the office and uh, as long as we provide a safe environment. Uh, London, it's, it's negative. Uh, we've done a survey uh, this week and um, 87 of uh, our team said that uh, they refused to return to, uh, to the office. Uh, in London, but um, in the region, people are, are excited. So originally we, we decided to go on a 12 to 18 month program to reopen our, our offices. So anything happening earlier would be a bonus for, for everyone. And um, over the last few weeks, we, we decided to reopen some of the uh, regional offices, um, which has been very much welcome. And the demand is, is growing. So um, we've decided to, from four offices to open another 18, uh, by the 1st of September, and um, people in the region are, are very excited. They, they want to go back because, um, well, they use bicycle, they use their own car, which obviously uh, helps, and, and we provide them a, a secure environment, um, you know, with, with the office. Um, but it, it has become quite uh, complicated still. Uh, I agree with, uh, with David and Amish in terms of uh, the message from the government. You mm -hmm. know, we, we get questions all the time uh, you know even if uh, we, we say to them that the environment is, is safe they always refer to what they hear uh, or what they read and and it's it's just so confusing that we're having to justify things that don't really make sense yeah, no, so it's making the whole work the whole process uh, more complicated um and, and painful well going um, into a going into a broader topic then is is a government i get is it also media because the media do talk a different language at times, don't they, to the average person in the street? They're, they're, the, scary, uh, they're the scary one, for sure. You have to stop, uh, you know, watching or reading because it's it just, uh, just becoming even more scarier. Uh, but, um, uh, yeah, for, for us, it's really the, the government. It's a challenge. Um, and because they come up with new messages on, almost on a daily basis, you've got to they come back with more question and, and you've got to, yeah, just... Uh, it's just a, a painful uh, uh, concept and uh, a process. And, and when we'll, we'll look at London, probably around September, October, well, God knows where we'll what be uh, when, when we'll reach that, that time. Um, but um, that's interesting. Yeah, it's... Uh, is it a, so, Ramesh, you live in London, you have an office in London. How do you see things getting back? Well, we, 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 we have an office in Ogate Tower and we have an office in uh, Mayfair. The Mayfair office has been open for a while, um, but you cannot go in unless you actually booked an appointment to go in and they approve of it. Um, but hardly anyone is going in because... Uh, so you've got to book appointments to go to work? You have to book approved. appointments to go into work and you have to justify why you need to even go there. So, but, but, but I think in, in, in our industry, a lot of people have been able to... Uh, work from home and work well as well. But the, but the other thing in London is, um, I'm not sure about August because we, we're getting, encouraging everyone to take holidays now and, and get, uh, make sure all the holidays are taken by the end of August. So they get ready to come to work in September. But the other thing, Chris, is that we have this uh, seven day congestion charge now, which is stopping a lot of people from taking the cars even uh, in the evenings to restaurants and places. So unless you've got a good uh, bicycle or you're happy to travel by public transport, I think it's, it's all, all a huge problem. And I, and, and I agree about the government messaging, et cetera, because I think they, they put the entire country into an induced coma for, <laughs> for three months. And then, then when they said, okay, come out of that coma, I think the younger people, for them it was easier because a lot of them, um, have not seen any symptoms or met anybody who has suffered. So for them, it, it doesn't exist. Whereas for a lot of other people, I think, um, and certainly, I mean, I'm an example of somebody who says, I will not be the first one to rush out. I'll wait until uh, things improve. Let me see what happens and, uh, and, and, and take my time. And I think that uh, applies especially to travel. 
and traveling abroad and saying, look, I'm happy if I don't need to travel abroad, but if there's an opportunity here, then it's a different opportunity as well. Um, I, but having said that, I mean, we did complete a deal yesterday. We sold a property, uh, a commercial property in Baker Street with Gourmet Burger as, a, as the main tenant. Uh, luckily, we sold it to a dentist who operates from there and he wanted it for his pension scheme. But we had to agree, uh, put, put one year's rent on deposit in case Gourmet Burger go bust over the next 12 months. We also had to put one year's rate or rates on deposit for the same reason. Um, and, um, but, but having said all that, we still took the risk and said, fine, we're getting a good price for it for the client. And we did the deal, but it, it was painful doing that deal. And, and especially, especially dealing with banks where you no longer have that engagement of sitting across them and talking to them. Because they, they, when they speak to you now, they come on a no, no ID caller phone. And they're so busy, you can't, you can't even engage. You have no idea. You can't even, they don't want, want to do Zoom calls with us. And it, it makes it so difficult to actually get anything out of them because they hide behind policies and things. It's, it's very frustrating. So we, 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 we're sitting on a lot of money now and nothing to do because yeah. uh, they've taken all the, all the money from the sale of one out of four properties and made it very difficult for my client to say, look, let me go out and look for something else because they're saying you come back again, we start afresh. It just, it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it is frustrating. And I think on, on a day-to-day -day basis, I agree with people that you wake up and you think, wow, I'm going to have a great day. And by four o'clock, you think, wow, what's, what's happened again? <laughs> so I, 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 I think we go through frustrations, et cetera. But, uh, uh, and in, in our offices in uh, elsewhere, for example, I mean, we've been doing very well in Singapore, but in Dubai, um, you have to wear a mask in the office because they make impromptu visits, the government. And if, if, they, if they turn up and you haven't got a mask on, that's an instant fine. So you almost, you almost got to have it around with you because they say that's the only way things are going to happen. And, and here, I mean, living in uh, Maida Bell, if you go down Edgeware Road, you might be forgiven for thinking, Nothing has happened. So I, I remain pockets, isn't it? I remain confused. Well, look, it's interesting, isn't it? Paula, you're based up in Yorkshire. How's how's it in Yorkshire? How are you yeah, seeing the terms? I think it's been overall. It's been quite. It, it's felt quite positive in terms of when places have reopened. But I suppose it's a you know York. I'm I'm sort of based in York, so smaller city. I think there was a desire sort of for people to come out so there's a there, there seems to have been a lot more people around and certainly I think with the local so there's that division isn't there I think that we've talked about I think in the discussions before that it feels like the recovery for local businesses is a lot stronger and sooner than it will be for larger cities especially you know people that I know that um go that work in London even sort of from here that they would normally take the train or they don't, so they don't, they're driving. So there's still, I think, a little bit of fear in terms of public transport. And I think that's a big um, challenge really in terms of how, how do you re-engage with people and you know, give clear uh, messages that build confidence around people um, feeling like they want to, I suppose, just take, a, 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 it's not a, it, how do you allow people to manage risk because you can't have no risk and I suppose the economy does need to restart and so yeah and whether um, hospitality I think can play a part in in building back that confidence um, and how they I suppose deliver the experience I think is also um, key. I think a, there is a challenge there because I've been to I've been out quite a little bit I suppose locally and there's been places that have done it really brilliantly and very elegantly and maybe they're more of the places that are at the higher quality end and there are other places that have maybe just I suppose fed to the fear a bit more in terms of the, the, the sort of notices and the and even the way that the, the, the team are, you can feel that they're a little bit nervous as well uh, so I think there is something about how you equip people when they are reopened to make sure that that experience doesn't feed. I suppose if people, if that, if people have gone out for the first time and that's what they've got, there's a worry that they might then revert to not going again. So out of interest, since we reopened last week in, in the snow, how many people have been out for meals? 
how many it's just just two I mean, it's, I mean that's uh, I'm interested because actually very few are saying Vicky what was your experience like hi Chris um very good actually we've actually been out twice although the first time was only for a drink um because we've had one business which i think i spoke about on an earlier call these are local and we're lucky we've got a lot that that's literally within walking distance in good old watlington but the place i was speaking about several weeks ago where the um landlord has established it as it's called now called the spoke and spire and it's very much aimed at cyclists and what he's done is filled the garden with these unique um, handmade wooden covers and they've all got different roofs and they're all made from recycled timber and it's very quirky and very different and um, he's got a great interior space he's really done it well he opened on Saturday night and from the minute it opened at lunchtime through until late on Saturday people were queuing outside to get in that's inside and a garden that suits seats probably 50 60 people um despite the weather so we didn't go in on that day because it was too busy but what we did do is go up during the week to one of the pubs locally and they've done very well again real focus on the outside very much simplified menu it was pouring with rain so we did sit inside and he'd done a beautiful job of it but what was interesting speaking to him and he's a long-standing swiss hospitality person who's opened this lovely pub in Oxfordshire he's so depressed by the whole experience and it's nothing to do with the numbers or the, the money he's making or not he says it's not hospitality and that was the first thing he came over to see us and we were like hey it's great to be back and this is lovely and he's like oh, it's not really we're all spaced out I've had to sterilize the cutlery it was easy going into lockdown it's really difficult coming out you know, he'll get there, but it was a great experience apart from the fact that, and he's not the only one, the several of the older publicans in the area are feeling the same way that this is a change they didn't want to make. Whereas the younger ones are, at, you know, as well, it's like I was saying earlier about Soho, I honestly think there is an age thing involved here to a degree. But yeah, the experience was very good. It was very safe. I felt very safe. The only difference is that the poor old publican was just so depressed by the whole experience that that perhaps didn't come across as well but apart from that it was excellent well that's going to be the interesting piece you're right is it going to change service standards do we think well um he says this week that he's going to introduce a larger menu because at the moment he's just bogged down by all the restrictions so i can't get two chefs in the kitchen whereas my husband who's been working all the way through in the catering environment says you can you absolutely can and here's how and i think to some extent it's people aren't used to it and they've those who haven't been working all the way through have been away from it slightly too long and are frightened they don't quite know what to do and perhaps the smaller businesses with all the different you know, he hadn't heard about this dining out scheme that the government has, has uh, launched this week because basically there's too much information for him to keep on top of. Um, I, think, I think there's a lot more focus around us on the outside, on simplified menus, on queuing at the right place at the right time. But, but everyone's got it, but we're not in the middle of a city and there's the difference. Um, so I think it will gradually creep back. What will be interesting to see is what happens when we get to colder months, genuinely colder months, where you cannot use the outside spaces to the same extent. But people are going and they're going on spec around here. So, you know, let's see. We were in um, Tunbridge Wells during the weekend, last weekend, and the ivy there was absolutely packed. We didn't go in, but you could see them. They'd obviously pre-booked. They'd got the spaces between the tables, but people were queuing all the way down the street. So I think there is... There are green shoots, very definitely green shoots. The challenge is how you get people back into a big city, and that's a whole different. So, is it? So, do you think it's public transport is the key? Or do you I think, think there's a lot to be said for that. Yes, um, and one of the things I kind of noted down earlier is if we're serious about London, then also to uh, Ramesh's point, do something about the congestion charge, and God forbid, reduce the parking. You yeah, know, I know, I know there's a whole issue over the environmental piece of it, but this is temporary. We've got to think of this about a temporary piece. Make it easy for people to get in under their own steam. I mean, Vicky is right, Ramesh, isn't she? Because it's a strange time to increase the congestion <laughs> charge, isn't it? It's bonkers. Ramesh? Yeah, I, I, think, I think there's a problem in terms of the local government and the national government and uh, two different parties so it, nobody's actually thinking of the people there it's, it's, it's point scoring and and this is the 
um, the mayor's way of saying, look, uh, my, my city is going bankrupt. You need to put in money. If you don't put in money, I'm going to increase the congestion charge. I'm also looking at increasing other things. And he's trying to force the government's hand. And the government's ignoring him. They don't even bring him into meetings. So, so and then we, we are the victims of all of that. So I, I, I was, I've been thinking that maybe every time there's a pandemic or in the future, you actually need a national government and some, some, some intelligent people to sit down and work out what is best for the country rather than saying, uh, okay, I'll do, my, do it my way. And we're doing it, we're doing it our way in terms of four different governments anyway. So again, that is causing a confusion in, in terms of the rest of the world because they don't know whether you can actually fly to Edinburgh and what will happen to you. I mean, it's just, it's bonkers. Ariana, you want to come in here? Hi, yes, I wanted to comment on this. So I grew up in a communist country, right? So the law and order and what is said, you have to obey. You just don't have a choice. So it made me think just a little bit now because you know, I'm originally from Slovakia and I've been watching how they dealt with it and how they mandated the masks, face coverings from the day one, early in March. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty sure maybe some of you have seen articles or, or whatnot, how our female president had matching masks to all of her outfits when she attended the European Union meetings and whatnot. Anyway, uh, so when it comes to fear, and I'm, I'm, I'm just comparing, right, I, all the noise and messaging coming from every nation, from US where I lived for 20 years, from Slovakia where I was born. So I'm comparing constantly and adding to the confusion. You know, I understand that a lot of things are not mandated here um, by the government, which is fine. You know, government maybe trusts the, the population, the residents of UK. Um, and they're suggesting everything, even the guidelines that came uh, for, for, for the hospitality establishments or for gyms, whatever, everything is suggested, nothing is enforced and mandated, which actually gives the freedom to people to make, up, to make their own decisions. But it also kind of makes everything much more prolonged and the fear steps in. And just from the example, um, you know, I was supposed to meet two friends on Sunday for brunch. So we started planning it and we ended up being in the park doing picnic again instead of going out because one doesn't want to pay congestion fee driving from uh, Arnos Grove into the London. So we stopped up to up at Regent's Park <laughs> where the line was. So I said, okay, well, let's look there. Where, where could we eat there? The other one was trying to take a tube and got in and walked out, freaked out because no one was wearing a mask and everybody was sitting next to each other, jam packed, no social distancing whatsoever. And she was the only one having a mask and she looked around and got out and, and got into the Uber. Um, and, and the Uber started complaining that she's asking him to go through the highest traffic areas because they extended these walkways for the pedestrians, right? So they can, so pedestrians can socially, uh, physically distance. So therefore they eliminated the driving uh, roads for the cars to fit in. So it's congestion. You, you go, you can't get, get through the King's Road in Chelsea. You can't get through Sloan Square. You can't get back when you get towards the Mayfair. It's just jam packed because the walkways are, the pathways are empty. Uh, yet the cars are stuck, which is again, not good for pollution. And, and it just takes you twice as long. So she made it to us in an hour and a half to, up to Kensington Park, which we already we missed our reservation. We, missed, we ended up just picking up something from a coffee shop and, and just being on the ground in a park. So it's just a small experience. On, she, she was fearful because she said, well, they recommend wearing masks in the closed spaces and then you get into the tube and, and no one's wearing a mask and people are sitting next to each other. They don't try to allow the train to skip and get into the next one. No, train comes, people load in and go. So there is her fear against the fearless inside. <laughs> so I think it's like half, half. Now, is the question here, and I'm going to bring both Zenio and Damien in here as well, because you're all about service, but is AI the secret here? Is it going to be AI that unlocks all this? Well, who wants to start? Uh I don't know. I think the power of human interaction is still going to make us stronger. Gaining this, the, the but truth we, back. 
But we've got to get over, you're right, but haven't we got to get the balance between service, which I think will improve, yeah. people will get more personal, and safety. Sorry, Zenio, please come in. And, uh, because you have a Spanish, I assume you have a Spanish perspective here as well, won't you? <laughs> yes, yes, hello. Uh, well, it's actually Javier, so then is the company you just plugged in with the <laughs> company email. Um, well, certainly AI can, can sort some things, but uh, you were all having kind of a point with uh, where the fear is. So, I mean, you can do things with AI and AI can give, can provide some information to, to systems. Uh, put it, uh, Mariana was speaking about the tube. So getting in the tube, AI can tell you, oh, this is bad, don't get in that train. But if nobody really cares about what's going on and they just get in the train. Yeah, exactly. The, um, so, because many times it's like, oh, what can technology do for this? Or, or what can we do to know if something is going on, if there's a traffic jam? Is, you, so all these systems, all these technologies, they're to provide information, and, but it cannot make decisions. It can help make decisions based on data, based on, on information. But if there is a fear or some people have to fear, but others don't, it's something, it doesn't really help to solve, to solve the problem. No, it can There's provide a, more information on the problem, but, but, but definitely not sort it. Isn't one of the weird things that the world's probably never been safer overall. I know we've got the pandemic, but overall we've never been in a safer place. And yet we've never seemed to be more fearful at the same time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and now in terms of the fear, I mean, why is there that fear? Uh, if you listen to any, almost any government in Europe, uh, uh, headlines, it's, when they are going, now that we are going back to, to opening everything and open uh, restaurants and bars and pubs, it's like nothing had happened. It's like, oh, uh, yeah, you, in Spain, for example, it's like, oh, now, a month ago, it was very, very, uh, you could not travel from the UK to Spain because it was something very dangerous for you. It was not good at all. And now you can travel from all over Europe, you can travel to Spain, all over Africa, you can travel from South America with no issue whatsoever. So, of course, they've been for three months telling us how dangerous it was to travel. And now from one day to another, it's like, yeah, you can go on and travel because it's, it's, now it's safe. So, um, I mean, people don't really trust what they are hearing from the government. I, 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 that's the feeling I get. It's like, you don't have an idea of what's going on and you're just saying things that try to make people work it out, but <laughs> you don't really have an idea. So uh, what do we fair. have to do? I think, I, I think that's very fair. I think there's actually too much conflicting information. But Gary, you'll say in Scotland, that's been very good. Is that fair? Well, e even yesterday when Nicola Sturgeon announced uh, the opening of phase three uh, next week, effectively, she's still saying, uh, be very cautious. The, the virus is still out there. Um, it's one of the things, and, and I'm, not, I'm not politically motivated at all, um, but it's one of the things that I've been very impressed with, a lot of people being impressed with, about how much caution she always expresses to, to, to the community. You know, she wants to open up, uh, but be very mindful the virus is still out there. And I, I do think, you know, obviously we want the economy to, to reopen and recover, uh, but there is still, as we all know, there's a lot of anxious people out there. We've been locked down for three months. Um, and especially, you know, what, what certainly what I see in here, uh, I, I think it's going to be a slow opening. People are going to go out, but they're going to want to feel safe. And until... But isn't this, sorry, Gary, just cut across, isn't this the, isn't this the challenge? In some ways, I know she's scoring great points for showing great care to the community and being, showing genuine compassion. Is that fair? Yes. Seems so she At the same time. Politician. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, do, do we need a more bullish message? Question mark. Absolutely. And, and, and I think uh, that's, that's where the, 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 the press have a role to play. Because as we all know, the press are very negative. So um, we do need to get the messages out there that it's safe uh, or safer, as long as people abide by the rules. And, and that's unfortunately not what a lot of people are doing. And that, that's the concern. Um, oh, wow. you know, just like Remesh was saying, you know, 
not wanting to go out yet until we feel it's safe to go out there. And the only way we're going to find out is time. Yeah. Damien, bring you in at this point. Yeah, morning everyone. Hi. Your views of all this? Um, I think I think there is obviously there is that fear factor, but I think people, I mean, this isn't going to go away. Um, it's going to be with us for a long time. Um, and I think there's a certain aspect that people will have to learn to live with it. Um, and what, as an industry, from, from my point of view, is, is, is making sure that we're consistent with the message to give people that confidence, to give people that reassurance that our premises, etc., are safe to visit, are safe to eat, are safe to drink at. Um, and everyone's right, the, the government at times, it's mixed messaging, but the main, most important thing is making sure in the hospitality industry is that our message is consistent, that we have done everything, we followed through on the actual um, what we have to do, and you have to make it make people feel safe and give them the confidence to spend at your establishments. No, that's right. Nico, uh, it's been sorry. Morning, everybody, and apologies. I've just seen it says Grace P under my name, the result of a brownie Zoom call last night uh, for my daughter. <laughs> um, and one of the one of the, the fear factors I have, and, and I've been listening throughout and a couple of things that uh, people have said, and I wonder, for me, the fear factor personally is not about the virus itself. And it may, may be a bit naive because nobody I know has been affected very badly with the virus. My fear factor is about actually the next message from the government, which will mean my kids still don't get back, go back to school, which means I'm homeschooling for the next three months which is stopping me from doing other things. Um, so for me, it is all about that government messaging and how, and, and, and it stops me from doing things because I'm more worried about the effect of what it means for me in the future versus actually getting ill or, or people getting ill around me, which I say may be a bit, a bit naive. But I do think it's, a, it's an age thing as well. What's stopping me from going out is my two young children. I've got a seven and a, and a 10 year old. And do I want to go out with them into a space and expose them um, is, is probably the biggest thing that's stopping me. And I think, you know, what happened in Soho um, and, and many people going out is because actually there is a lot of younger, the younger generation going out and feeling less exposed and, you know, we're going to go out and have a good time and release all that energy and, and, and get on with it. But um, certainly from, from our perspective with a young family, it makes you think a little bit differently about going out. So, Matt, so Vicky and Mariana are both making a point in the chat that actually it's not the fear of locations, interestingly, it's a fear of other people and other people's behaviours. Do you agree on that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it, um, yeah, it is the fear of their behaviours, but I think everybody can be sensible in your own right. You know, you wear a mask, you do the right thing. And we know in the hospitality industry, we have been one of the safest industries out there given all the regulation that we follow. So even if I'm going into a pub or a restaurant, I know it's going to be pretty clean anyway. And I know that it's going to be a, a fairly safe environment. Um, so it does come down to the actions of, of what others are doing. Um, and and it, it comes back down to the, you know, we were talking about signage earlier and how signage could adversely affect the experience you have. And we always, when I was uh, working for a, for a contract catering business, was about, you know, signage needs to be subtle, it needs to be engaging, it needs to let people, keep people informed, it needs to be um, well displayed um, and not too, too much in your face. Whereas now you probably feel safer if you see a big yellow sign saying we are doing this and we are keeping our premises clean. So that whole messaging piece has, has absolutely changed. People are, want to see bigger, brighter warnings now because it makes them feel safer about where they're going. So you support Damien's point of view that we've got to, we've got to get, make a better message that we are safe. I think, I think so. And I think we, we shouldn't forget that we are one of the safest industries out there when it comes to hygiene. So, you know, let's, let's, let's keep getting that message out there. Okay, good point. Right, we're coming to the end. Let me just put you all on the spot if that's okay, one by one. So, Paula, recovery? When by? Um, hopeful, I not hopeful. on a good day, I would say, I think, in the next 12 months, 12 months, yeah, 12 so months. Yeah, 12 months. Okay, Xavier? You got mute on me. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah. <laughs> so, my uh, so how long? How long do you reckon? Oh uh, well, I definitely don't know because it depends a lot on will there be a fear for a second wave? Uh, in Spain, of course, everything is about oh, there's a second wave, and a lot of people. Uh, even some big cities have been closed again. They have come back to a lockdown again uh, because there have been a bunch of cases. So. No idea. <laughs> no, I see Ramesh, you're being witty up there in the chat. So? Yeah, yeah, see Ramesh, really. Just bringing Ramesh in at this point. He's being witty on the chat. Right. Making no, sure I, he doesn't write the slogans. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, Chris, I, I think just coming back to this point about August and September, I think uh, there's a very good point made that until, until you get all the children back at school, I think a lot of parents are not going to go out either. <clears throat> so, which is why I think September, but I, I think in terms of uh, whether it's 12 months or 18 months, uh, I think it, it depends not just on us, it depends on the rest of the world as well, because the rest of the world is not open, it's, it's, very, it's going to be very difficult, um, especially if you can't get people in from China, India, the US, those three I countries. I never said it was a fair question. I just asked what your view is. No, I, said, no, I'm, I'm not, I think it's a very fair question, but I just think that there, those, uh, those factors in terms of what happens outside the UK borders, plus um, how we actually get, finally get around to dealing with Brexit and sort of imprison ourselves even more, I think might have a much greater impact in terms of the timeline. Okay, fair play. Mariana? I think we have to define the recovery, first of all. So as a coach, I question you back, define the recovery. I honestly, personally don't think we are going to go back to normal. Uh, there is going to be a spread out, out of the city. Everything is going to even out. The terrible, horrible negativity commutes in the morning where you have to let three trains pass because they're too packed and everybody's, nobody smiles. That has to go and we want that to go. Um, so I think that this whole segregate kind of just kind of urban planning of businesses is going to spread around the countries and it's going to even out between people that work from home and people that will go back to the office. And that will affect that that will kind of go through the whole motion of how other businesses like hospitality will adapt. They will focus on rural areas, not on a city. So, so just to be push back at you. you. You agree the figures that there's going to be a spreading out that probably yes. city, city centers are going to get 60-70% of people back and that, yes. but, other, but our local localities and communities will get the benefit. Is that yes. Fair? I said this right now I would think unless those 300 um, unless those 300,000 Hong Kongers we're supposed to accept will all settle in, in big cities. I mean <laughs> I made right. me think when I read that the other day. Sorry I'm throwing that in. There's <laughs> <laughs> quite a lot in there. Yeah. Gary? <laughs> Gary, your thoughts on this? Gary. Can't hear me? Sorry, you're on mute. Oh. Sorry, apologies there. Sorry, I lost connection earlier. Um, your view? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I do think that this time next year will be pretty much back to where we were before this pandemic started in London. I, okay. I, I do think people will come back. Um, I think the acceleration will be quicker than a, a lot of people are thinking now. Um, again, just picking on from, from earlier, um, you know, I went out for dinner uh, uh, last Saturday, uh, reopening of one of the Tom Carriage restaurants, and they did it very, very gradually. They only put in uh, sort of 45%. This week, they've already started to, to ramp it up. And a number of the restaurants are starting to do that. They, they kept it in a real distance last week. And they're gradually... So, so there, there could well be that capacity and demand. In terms of the workplace, I, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm old-fashioned. I believe you should be in an office, hence the reason I'm sitting in my office in Fleet Street <laughs> this morning. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think that certainly for London, I, I do think there will be a return. So, 12 months. Do you have a Gary, Gary Atkinson? In 12 to 18 months, I think um, it depends, obviously, as we come out of the lockdown and people get confidence, then it could be sooner. Confidence. Uh, but I think it definitely will be 12 months. I, I'm very. Um, looking forward to, to seeing what, what happens with the, the, the cities. 
Because I think it, it all comes down to that confidence of people feeling trust and feeling confident it's safe to go out and will not know until people are out there. Mm. And that, that'll have a knock-on effect to everything that we're talking about. That's so a year, cool. 18 months. Mary, uh, Vicky? My view is exactly the same as Mariana's, that actually what I hope is that this will, and again, I've said this all the way along the line, that our challenge in the UK, and I realise that doesn't help the hospitality industry, is that we're London-centric. We've been so London-centric for so many years. And if something doesn't change as a result of this, then I think we'll all be the poorer for it. So I think recovery, as it were, uh, will happen at different pockets at different times. The global impact can't be overlooked. Uh, the ability for large numbers, even of tourists, to visit the country uh, until that's happening, even the tourism side won't come up. But um, yeah, I, I think I, I, I'm not able to put a date around it. I think in some areas we'll see a recovery by the end of the year. In others, I think it'll take a lot longer. But my hope is that people will not have to go back to these soul destroying commutes and that their lifestyles will change for the better and that everyone has actually learned something from this experience and that urban issue is one that we can actually start to look at. Okay, Nico, give me a figure. I, I couldn't have said it any better. I think Vicky has just hit the nail on the head. Um, and because I've spoken to people I know in professional services and they're not going back to London until early next year. There's no need to. So, um, and I do think we need to spread out and I want to see more regional businesses and uh, eateries and, and do better. So agree, Vicky, very well said. Okay. Amish, quickly. Um, look, I think it's <laughs> the million dollar question. We'd all be wealthy if you could uh, work it out. <laughs> uh, my gut feel based on our business uh, says that uh, I think regionally uh, out of the big cities, things will be back to normal or some form of normal by next year, this time next year, because I think people will be desperate after a long, cold winter to get there. I think international travel, which drives a lot of the, the London type experience, maybe a bit longer. You know, the airline industry is still saying that pushing it back, so even now 23, 24 um, is the sort of the, the timeline to get back to last year's volume. So that's that. you know, a long, slow road back. Yeah. 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 Damien? Do you want to give me a, a thought? Um, I think as long as there's the consistent messaging, um, investment in technology to make customers feel safe and staff feel safe, um, and to also you can utilise technology to open hidden revenue pockets, I would say um, 12 months to, to 18 months. Okay. Alex? Quickly. Yeah, it's going to be uh, very interesting to see. Um, I would say rural will bounce back a bit quicker in Scotland. I think it's all going to come down to transport. Uh, you, haven't, you haven't put you on the spot here because you have an awards coming up. So when are you planning those? February. They were, they were planned for three months ago. <laughs> then they were put back to September, October. And we're just about to extend to February because we believe it's close enough to still have it in uh, close enough to 2020 to still be relevant but far enough away for us to actually have a chance of putting something on. Um, I do think transport to these cities and to rural um, is gonna be key because people are gonna get confidence back once they know that they can get there safely. As somebody said earlier, it's all about how other people behave and they can't regulate that when they're stuck on a train. Um, so I completely agree with what, what and I see really Mariana was saying. And I see Ramesh has added a comment that this time next year we will be millionaires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so on that boat next, so we'll finish on that and say thank you very much for joining us. And I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.